One of the reasons why I want to do this, obviously, is to help you as well with your uh, paper that you're writing. Welcome back. This is AP English, and we're now going to make some observations that are specific to Republic 8-9. Uh, however, before we get there, I want to make a couple of quick observations about Republic 7 and the concluding, conclusion of our lecture of yesterday. Um, First of all, let me point out that uh, Plato will, I, will kind of outline in, in abstraction what he thinks the ideal education would look like. Uh, let's start there. So you might want to write this down as a great way to kind of start to think about the paper that you're going to be writing. What is the Socratic education like? I'm working off of your lecture notes, so there's a lot of this you probably don't need to write down. You know, you've already got this into. Uh, let's begin by pointing out that Socrates and Plato both would believe that the way you get to this education of the forms is through the study of what? Mathematics. Mathematics. There's a sign above Plato's door, which actually stayed above Mr. McGee's 303 door for many, many years, that says, let him who is devoid of geometry enter not here. <laughs> that Actually, that sign was above Plato's school. It, and, and he reserved the right to walk up to any of his students and ask a math question. And if you couldn't answer it well, he threw you out of school. I should point this out. This is really important. The idea that we have, for example, at Worlin High School, that there's parts of the building where you go to study certain things. So for example, you go down that wing to study with Mr. Dupree in science. You go down the far other wing to study um, art and these divisions of these disciplines. Socrates and Plato didn't understand learning that way. For them, they were all kind of intermingled in some way, okay? We might even use the term integrated. And yet, he did have a certain kind of approach to education theory. Let me share it with you. Uh, he he um, suggested that educational uh, approaches pedagogy should be sequenced this way. One, uh, arithmetic. Only basic numbers, right? Two, plain geometry, as in P L A and E. Three, solid geometry. Four, this one surprises students sometimes. He believes that you should have a really good background in astronomy. No kidding. Spending lots of time studying the stars, the planets, the heavens. For Socrates, is a really important part of learning. Then there's this thing, number five, he called harmonics which, uh, of course, uh, related to the harmony and music. All of this derived from uh, what great philosopher? Anybody know? Pythagoras, right, that's right. This is all Pythagorean, right? And then finally, at the end of all of that, and the debaters in the house are all going to stand up and say yes, finally, dialectics, debate. You must learn how to exchange ideas back and forth. Here's the concern Socrates had, though. He said, if you start this dialectic thing too early, then students will start to think of it all as a game, and this will turn into that sophistry that Socrates is so opposed to. Now, that's the overview. Let's talk about a little bit more detail. This is the educational approach for the philosopher king. Uh, by the way, yes, one or two people have actually tried this, believe it or not. One... Stage one, birth to the year 18. Here, our interests are only literature, music, and basic mathematics. By the way, Socrates is the one who actually said the first 18 years of our schooling, our education, should only be fun. In other words, he said it this way. If you're a teacher that cannot make mathematics fun, or cannot make literature fun, or cannot make music fun, then you shouldn't be teaching it. So all the time children are studying through the first 18 years, everything is games, playing of games, having fun. It's all kind of low stress so that students can begin to work. Uh, then you have your little test at 18. All right, and then we start the second stage. Ages 19 to 20, 
we're going to have intense PE classes. This involves military training, physical training. We don't have any time to study during these years. All we're doing is learning how to run the mile, lift lots of weights, learn how to fight hand-to-hand -hand combat and all that kind of stuff. That's ages 19 to 20. At then the year 20, age 20, we'll have our first major test. That test will include both physical feats, how many pull-ups can you do, how far can you run, how well can you beat up people? How well can you wield a sword and all of those kinds of things? And as well, can you kind of recite large numbers of lines from Homer's Iliad and this kind of thing? By the way, I should point out, he suggests that our PE classes do calisthenics, but remember what he said about education? About guys and girls? What did he say? Girls get lighter? They're, they're, girls and guys are all going to take the same courses. Oh. But in his PE classes, he wants us to all do our calisthenics naked. So we're all going to be doing jumping jacks together naked. You'll see. Okay, so there you go, Mr. Schreiber. You can think about that as a... See, there are some of us who would say, yeah, there's some people at World in High School, frankly. I don't know I want to see doing jumping jacks without large numbers of garments on. Uh, stage three. The 10 years from 20 to 30 for Socrates are precious years. These are the 10 years of advanced mathematics. Socrates could have absolutely no respect <coughs> for you as a student if you were not willing to spend serious numbers of years studying mathematics theory. Way to go, Mr. Krudner. Uh, stage four. Ages 30 to 35, after the mathematics, and that's important that Socrates says it this way, after all the mathematics, then and only then are we ready to begin learning how to debate. Because he says if you teach kids how to debate too early, they're not going to understand the importance of the linguistic exercise, and they're kind of like puppies that roll around on the ground biting on each other's ears. It's a wonderful little metaphor. At age 35, stage five, at age 35, we're finally ready for our next major test, and that, those who pass that one will go on to be our philosophers. Those who don't pass that one will end up being our soldiers, right? So there'll be an enlightened soldier class. By the way, I should point out, for those of you who don't know this, um, at the U.S. military, uh, historically, has been very, very influenced by Plato. So that, for example, if you go to the Naval Academy right now, you will find guys who can bench press 450 pounds and can run a 4740. But they also will spend long, long hours studying mathematics, which is why they produce some of the best engineers. So they can do both. I mean, they are unbelievably gifted in terms of uh, you know, physical contests. Uh, when you put them in military engagements, there's a reason why our top military uh, you know, secret forces are, are, are so good. I mean, they come, out, they come out usually with their kills. But they're also brilliant, brilliant math minds, history minds, literary minds, uh, at the Naval Academy, at West Point, of course, at the Air Force Academy, you know, this is the case. Um, finally, we're going to, from age 35 to age 50, this is really interesting. After you get all of this intelligent work done, you then go into the uh, real world and you have to live with normal people for a period of 15 years where you get to know them. You hang out, for example, at the mall. You get a job. Are you ready for this? After all of that work up to age 35, you get a job working at Amber Crombie in the mall. That's the job you have. You actually have to do that. Remember our word picture? What does the guy do once he gets outside the cave? He turns right around and he goes right back down into the cave, right? That going back down into the cave is working at Abercrombie. In other words, you get the worst of jobs. You get to clean toilets. I mean, here's a guy who's like brilliant, brilliant, or a woman who's unbelievably brilliant, and yet her job is going to be working in some menial task. Why? Because you're working with other people who someday you're going to write laws for, and you need to know who those people are. If you don't have this, Socrates predicts, you're going to have this ruling elite class 
that has no ability to relate to normal people. And because they have no ability to relate to normal people, they'll make goofy laws that normal people will be like, well, why are we, like, what is, and then you'll get this fissure between your rulers and the rest of your, the rest of your society. And in an ideal state, that just won't work. Uh, so there you go. The introductions to uh, education, uh, the, the way we kind of finish Republic 7, and uh, really we think of it as Republic 1 through 7. And to some degree you can think of Socrates as kind of leaning back now and saying to Glaucon, all right, I've done it, I've kind of answered your question. But now there's going to be one other bit of information that Glaucon's wanting to ask, and it has to do with this thing we call declension of state. Let's go to it now. Uh, this model, I think I've shared with you before, this becomes one more little iconic model that becomes really important. We've already kind of introduced it. Remember we talk about, this is Republic 8-9 now, we're talking about Republic 8-9, and when we enter Republic 8-9, we are talking about what we call declension, from our word decline, declension of state, okay, declension of state. Remember we have this thing we'll call A, the beginning of our society, quickly it can die out, or it can ascend what we will call B. And then finally, there's this thing called C, the declension of state. When things start to go bad, right? When things start to fall apart. It is fascinating to me how regularly high school seniors will report to me that they find history a boring subject. I'm always amazed by that. Socrates would say that's probably because we've been introduced to the concept through handouts, PowerPoints, and worksheets, instead of recognizing that in sophomore year when we did world history, all of those units ended with this. Dude, Babylon ain't around anymore. That was the greatest, imaginable greatest empire. Where is Assyria now? Rome is no empire like it was before. Your American students studying that what amazing cultural pride or hubris to imagine that someday in 5,000 years or less, the United States won't be given a chapter in a history book. What? See, this is the question for reading of history. Why does this happen? And can we see any kind of sense of how it happens over and over again? Remember the great philosopher of Harvard, uh, Santiana, said, those who forget the past are damned to repeat it. He was, a he was a student of Plato. He lectured Plato at Harvard. And that's exactly, that's exactly Socrates' point. But watch this. Socrates will say that not only do groups ascend and decline, but individuals do as well. Okay? So we can talk about the clinching of the group state, or we can talk about the clinching of the individual. All right? And the way he talks about this is to talk about it now not as a just republic, but as an unjust republic or an unjust society. Okay. Moving away from the ideal, we've already kind of pictured the ideal as this, remember, three-class system where this enlightened citizenry, this communal group, this uh, group of uh, edu well-educated philosopher kings kind of you know, rule, and then you have your soldiers, and then you have your workmen. One step away from that is what we will call democracy. And again, I'm just working right off your lecture notes as well. Democracy. Democracy, the democratic state, is basically Sparta. For those of you that liked the film 300, basically Sparta. All right? And here, what is most important is not that group, that upper class group that Socrates outlines, but rather that second group, soldier class. When you look at any kind of civilization where soldiers run the show, that is a democratic state, okay? That is a democratic state. Rules matter. Honor matters as opposed to wisdom. Now it becomes courage as the central value of the state. One step away from that, we have an oligarchy. The oligarchy, no longer interested in soldiers running the show, but rather now, the key thing is money. The people who have wealth are the people who get to run the show. Whereas before, notice in Plato's ideal state, it was the people who have the knowledge and wisdom run the show. One step away, democracy is the people who have strength and courage run the show. 
One step away from that oligarchy, the people who have the money run the show. If you drive your Mercedes and you have your own parking spot at the country club, that means you get to run the show. Got me? Um, you begin to have a rich and a poor class, and for Socrates, this is a big dog deal. When you start to have a rich class that runs the show and a poor class that does, you know, that has nothing, they have no wealth of any kind, you begin to get a gap there. For Socrates, he makes an interesting prediction and one that is always fascinating uh, as, as an American lecturer to, to share with you in a moment. By the way, he points out one of the key insights of oligarchy is that the ruling class who's so wealthy starts to become lazy. I mean, basically, they got nothing to do other than to figure out ways to spend their money, and they become kind of lazy. One step away from oligarchy is the worst for Socrates, democracy. He will say of democracy, it's really pretty simple. This is the Athens of his day. Are you ready for this? He says it inevitably happens that when you have people running the show who are interested in money, they start spending too much of it. And then he says what happens is that the, de the, the fall into democracy is easily identified by going into debt. And he says when a nation is in debt and it no longer has wealth anymore of its own and it must borrow, it is over. There is no coming back. It's done. There is no coming back. Why? Because there's no longer any discipline. The hallmark of a democracy is that everyone thinks he or she can do whatever he or she wants. It's undisciplined. And ultimately you have greed, broadcasts of freedom for all, at any costs. And it's at that point, everyone wants someone else to pay for him or her to be successful. Right? <laughs> By the way, there, is a, there is, seems to be a reference here to what we today would understand as that legal class where you sue everyone for something and that kind of thing as well. Mr. Keller, observation. So would Plato argue that the United States is on its decline as opposed to its rise? What I would say about this question, and it's, a, it's of course a profound question, isn't it? Uh, that question matters more when you're 18 than when you're 88. Would you agree with me? Question that question matters. It at all. Oh, it's, a fair, it's a fair question to ask. When Socrates defines the decline of state as a democracy inevitably becoming a welfare state, which is what he called it, a debtor state, a welfare state, he wasn't done, though. He wasn't done. Believe it or not, there is another state after that. We can actually go farther down the, the rat hole into democracy. We can descend even further. <coughs> Here it starts to get really kind of interesting. He says what happens next is the tyrannical state, a state of tyranny. Are you ready for this? What happens is that everyone's in debt. You have large numbers of people who have absolutely nothing the, the leaders have become so avaricious for wealth that everyone starts to point fingers. Out of this chaos, Socrates predicts, an <coughs> orator will rise, a speaker, someone who is great with language, who can speak and everyone will listen. And he mesmerizes the people by promises he cannot keep. He is then put into office. He is voted by all of the people into office where he then will dominate for his own well-being. The hallmark of a tyrannical state is that the first thing he will do, I'm not making this up, you can read Republic 8-9 if you want to, is he will raise taxes. That is the hallmark. At the moment the tyrant starts raising the taxes, it is really then over. Or is it? Because Socrates seems to suggest that what then can happen is a revolution of sorts, where people grow so weary of it all, that they then will revolt 
and began to try to start the process all over again. Now, Mr. Keller's question is a valuable one, but what I would say about that is you can only really answer a question like that by analyzing prior civilizations. What happened to Rome? Fully 600 years of history. That's a long time to be in power. Can you take that picture of Platonism and somehow lay it over your study of history? So, for example, by 200 Common Era, there's this really influential Roman emperor named Marcus Aurelius. Guess what he spends all of his time reading? Republic. He reads Republic. In fact, he, he memorizes most of Republic. Book 8-9 for him is central to understanding what's happening in Rome. And to answer Mr. Kelleher's vital question, he begins to realize at any given moment, we can start to try to push the rock back up the hill. But any of you that have ever rolled boulders downhills, you know it's much easier for the boulder to go down the hill than it is to come up back up the hill, right? So that is to say, Socrates wouldn't argue that it is an inevitability about this decline, but it seems to be the way it kind of works out. For each of these different declensions of state, we also have a declension in personality. So, for example, you can have the democratic individual, spirited, emotional, we think of Achilles. You can have the oligarchic individual. We think, for example, of Kephlas at the beginning of our, of our uh, dialogue, money. You can have the democratic man who is only interested in fulfilling his lusts, his desires. He shows up at the university and the only thing he's interested in is the next party and who he's going to be with physically. Or the tyrannical, in the end, this isn't even worse than the democratic. There are no guiding principles anymore. It's totally about lust in every way. By the way, the tyrannical person has no friends because no one can trust him. Because he'll say and do anything to get what he wants for his own well-being. And over time, nobody can trust an individual like that. I should point out, though, that Socrates' view here in Republic 8-9, it's not a very hopeful view. He says once you start down the road of sliding, it's very, very hard to come back, which is why the early education is so important. If you are not taught in your early youth issues of discipline, it's very hard to impose discipline on yourself later. Which is why Socrates will argue that first 35 years individually is so important as well as when you look at a, at a nation. By the way, do you think Jefferson knew Republic? See, Franklin, Madison, Jay, all these founding thinkers, they're considered Enlightenment thinkers because they knew Republic. They read it. So they all knew this kind of idea. Thank you. Hope that you have a good weekend. Okay.